Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, so thank you for coming to the Lunch and Learn um, 8, um, where we're going to be focusing on having a discussion on the treatment of multidrug resistant infections and cystic fibrosis. Um, the goal of our session really, we put together a bunch of slides, probably more slides than we need, but they're <laughs> primarily there to raise questions and um, other things that come up in the treatment of MDR infections. And so we're really trying to encourage not just a conversation amongst ourselves up here at the table, but also you guys participating as we go along. And so we may um, ask uh, questions where we'll ask you to raise your hand and so then you won't have to interrupt eating. And other times if you guys wanna jump in at some point and um, share your own experience or things that you've actually learned along the course of treating MDR infections um, in your practice, um, I would say that you're more than welcome to come up to the microphone and interject. So, um, and we'll, uh, and if you do that, then we'll take a pause and, um, and solicit your input. So just uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, uh, my name is Mike Parkins. I'm the uh, um, clinic director in Calgary and I'm an infectious disease physician treating adults. And I'm Rafael Hernandez. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases physician at Seattle Children's Hospital. I'm Christina Thornton. I'm a respirologist from the University of Calgary. And I'm Ranjani Somiaji. I'm an adult infectious disease physician from the University of Calgary. So we have uh, no disclosures uh, amongst ourselves. Although I should say, according to the rules, we're supposed to disclose if we're going to discuss the off-label use of any medications. And so, as I'm sure you're all aware, everything's off-label. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the objectives, uh, we're going to talk about multidrug resistance, how that different uh, for every pathogen and every person you're talking about, some of the limitations of our current in vitro model systems, um, and where data is lacking, which is, is most everywhere. You want to do that case? Or? Sure. Okay, so we'll start with our first case. So 37-year-old male with advanced CF, his baseline lung function is 32% and has known chronic pseudomonas um, originosa lung infection coming in with an acute exacerbation. Um, you get a sputum culture that shows multiple morphotypes and kind of a nasty looking profile, as you can see there with um, a bunch of R's, not many S's to most of the antibiotics we use, um, which are listed there with their respective MICs. So maybe one of the first discussion points as you're pondering those profiles is how would you delineate or call this infection? What sort of terminology or classification would you use? Um, so really the uh, definition for multidrug resistance in CF goes all the way back to the 94 consensus guidelines from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation where they looked at all drugs within two or more classes uh, for pseudomonas and other pathogens and it's kind of evolved from that. We haven't really had a, a particular update and then there's also the pan drug resistance which has changed as the agents that we have available to us change. So when you're comparing uh, older literature to, to more current literature, what's called pan-resistant is, is certainly going to be different. Uh, what we do know is that colonization or infection with these organisms does associate with worse outcomes, including exacerbations. Um, and certainly there's great fear, particularly uh, amongst our patients being referred to transplant historically on outcomes associated with these multi- or pan-resistant organisms. So the uh, first person we're going to put on the spot is uh, Dr. Sumayaji. <laughs> Um, who was involved in a, a big group looking at antibiogram-directed therapy in CF outcomes. Okay, so the question I'm answering is how do I utilize antibiograms in guiding therapies? Do I even use them? Uh, I mean, it's a complex question, and I think, so this, uh, for um, those of you who are not familiar with it, so uh, this was a literature, a systematic review done to look at whether susceptibility testing correlates with outcomes, and the high line, one line summary is that it doesn't seem to, uh, based on the studies that are available. <clears throat> With that said, I think, you know, it's complicated. Uh, when we think about susceptibility testing, the assumption is that it should correlate with outcomes so that you should be able to predict success and failure in, in either occasion. Um, and uh, so then you're using an in vitro susceptibility test to then predict an in life success or failure which I think has complexities. And inherently that rule um, 
is based on monomicrobial, so single organism infections using IV therapies. And I think we would all agree in this room that uh, infections in people with CF are anything but that, right? So you have polymicrobial infections, polyclonal infection, and there's organisms beyond what you're even t potentially directing therapy at. There's a combination um, of therapies that you might be using. It might not be a single intravenous agent. You might be using combination intravenous agents, oral therapies, inhaled therapies. And so how do you put all that together? Um, and in vitro tests as a whole are static measures, right? So they're taking a single time point and then you're trying to predict a dynamic outcome. So um, I, I think that uh, this was interesting because we make assumptions about what we do. And so it was interesting to actually look at the literature uh, as to whether there is evidence. And so based on this, you could make an argument that maybe susceptibility shouldn't be the thing or the only thing guiding your antibiotic selection. Yeah, so we came up with a, a list of perhaps four reasons at least why susceptibility is uh, poorly associated with outcomes in CF. Uh, the most important perhaps of which is the profound heterogeneity that exists within chronically infecting pseudomonas. So unlike a ventilator-associated ventilator pneumonia where someone acquired pseudomonas aeruginosa six days ago and the population is wildly homogeneous, uh, our patients have been infected for at the very least years and very commonly many, many decades in which time they're uh, exposed to uh, a constant assault from the immune system and recurrent courses of antimicrobials, and they develop profound heterogeneity within their chronically infecting populations. Um, so here's an example of some work from uh, Juliet Fowraker, who was one of the first to demonstrate this, where she picked from an individual sputum sample 120 different isolates and looked at the Kirby-Bauer zone sizes of a number of standard <coughs> anti-pseudomonal antibiotics and within one individual um, sputum sample, you can see a profound diversity. And depending on which isolate you picked that, you would have wildly different antibiograms that were reported. Um, of, of course, the in, vi the in vivo model that we have in CF uh, uh, that uh, our pathogens are exposed to is very different than what's done in the lab. Again, short-term um, aerobic growth of planktonic organisms. Whereas within the CF airways, we know we have microcolonies and biofilms of chronically infecting pathogens living in um, a diverse environment, including areas which are highly anoxic, which we certainly know affect how uh, antimicrobials do work. Um, as Dr. Sumayaji pointed out, um, uh, polypharmacy, the fact that we don't use one antibiotic, or often two, often many antibiotics in combination, and there's the potential for um, um, all kinds of different interactions that we can see, whether they're uh, um, combined interactions and they're synergistic or at least additive, or whether they're negative interactions as well. And there's been some great work showing uh, the potential for uh, uh, negative interactions between uh, things like uh, azithromycin and tobramycin, um, which may have real world implications. Uh, so there's a number of different tests that we can look at in terms of predicting synergy. Um, in uh, poly, uh, sorry, in uh, polypharmacy interactions. And what's important, even then, depending on which synergy mode you look at, you'll get wildly different results. So we don't really understand synergy even in the lab, let alone the person. And, and finally, as everyone's familiar with, CF airways uh, infections are wildly polymicrobial. There's a vast array of organisms that exist within the airways. And while many of them are benign oral flora that get washed down into the lower airways, within that milieu there are organisms that certainly interact. Um, and we do know that our antimicrobials that we use do impact those organisms, and some of those may even associate with outcomes. And we also know that organisms are there can actually influence the um, um, utility of the antimicrobials that are prescribed. And there's a number of Prevotella species that have been described producing Tim and Shiv uh, ESBL enzymes that can degrade anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam antibiotics. Turn it over here. Yes, yeah, so case is taking a turn. So now with that information in mind, how would you treat a mild or modest event? So for example, if an FEV1 showed a drop of 7% or maybe there's some mild new hypoxia, particularly if the patient's on ETI. And then with that in mind, um, the decision around using one or more agents and what the thought process is around that. Um, so Dr. Sumayaji, you wanna comment on? Me on again, on okay. 
So I think especially in a context of ETI, I mean, uh, if you step back, I think we first have to understand what an exacerbation is and what the face of an exacerbation is in people on ETI, and we have to sort of relearn what that looks like. Um, and I think it, given that most people on ETI are potentially in a state of better health, we have the opportunity to use agents with less toxicity and potential for less harm, um, and especially in a mild or moderate event, right? And so think if it's somebody that's severely ill, septic, in the ICU, that might be where you choose different agents or combination agents. But when we have room um, to monitor them, I think I would tend to use more, like more likely one agent if I can. But with that said, I think the STOP360 trial, um, STOP AG trial is a plug um, for that trial, I think is asking that question. Because I think, again, we as clinicians and healthcare providers, and maybe just humans, tend to um, perpetuate anecdotal biases. And so I think it's important to say, how do we actually um, get good, robust evidence to guide our decision making to do the best for our patients? Um, one thing, of course, um, that we all commonly employ will be uh, different measures of prolonged infusions uh, and the utility of uh, um, beta-lactam antibiotics, whether they're continuous infusions or extended infusions. A lot of that's dependent on nursing resources on the wards. Um, while there is a great uh, in, in vitro body of evidence to support this approach, the uh, clinical data um, really isn't as strong in most areas of medicine, with the exception of CF. We actually have a, a bit of compelling data there. So there was a study done back at the uh, end of the 2000s uh, by the, the Herbert Group out of France, where they looked at a, uh, um, in the single center, a crossover designed uh, study looking at pulmonary exacerbations where they randomized people to continuous infusions versus intermittent infusions of ceftazidime. Um, and where they observed that, sorry, uh, you'll have to look very closely here, that the outcomes when broken down as a function of uh, patients who had quote unquote susceptible strains versus intermediate strains versus resistant strains in those organisms that were relatively easy to treat, there wasn't a big difference. But in those uh, more resistant organisms where we really need to get the extra gas mileage, so to speak, out of the uh, pharmacokinetics of our beta-lactams, we did see improved outcomes when we used the continuous infusions, both in uh, pulmonary function recovery and time to next exacerbation event when they did a, a per protocol um, and intention to treat analysis. Um, and recently, uh, just in the last couple of months, this has been adopted by a number of pharmaceutical, or sorry, uh, uh, pharmacy groups, uh, including the CF Foundation as a uh, um, reasonable approach, although it's not routinely advocated in every situation. Um, so Dr. Sumayaji already mentioned the 360, so we'll move on. Um, what about now? Okay, so now if you've done the approach you wanted to do, which may or may not uh, coincide with our thoughts, but if it were now D7 and the patient's clinical response was deemed less than ideal, or if it were initially a more severe event, would this potentially change your management? And if so, how would you do differently? And I think Dr. Somaya already kind of touched on some of the factors associated with that. All right, so there's the resistance profile again. So it's an ugly one to our standard drugs. Um, Dr. Sumaji, yeah. I'm just going to keep treating this patient. I'm on, <laughs> all it tells you is that I'm on service for a month now. So. <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, it comes down to if someone's not improving as expected, you have to reassess, right? So what are the patient factors? Um, why aren't they improving? Is it symptomatic? Is it spirometry? Are there other objective measures? Are there markers of inflammation? And then to guide your, guide your therapeutic decisions. And then depending on what you've started them on, this might be the time that you consider adding a therapy on or changing it all together to... to uh, a different therapy. Um, again, depending on what that means that they're not getting better, is it simply that they need more time? And and I think with exacerbations, also their past behavior on how they improve can help inform it. Um, and not better isn't necessarily worse. Uh, so that would be another thing to consider. So it might just be that they're slower to improve. So in which case, we can have a discussion about saying, hey, let's just give you a little bit more time on this agent. There's no reason to think that 
adding an agent or changing it is necessarily going to make the difference. And also, I think optimizing the other components of care, because I think antimicrobials are just one aspect of care. But are they actually doing airway clearance? Are they doing their therapies correctly? Um, and are we nutrifying them appropriately, right? So if, if they're not eating in hospital, that's not going to help with their infection. Um, one of the important things that, uh, though susceptibility profiles don't necessarily uh, associate well with outcomes in CF, uh, we do know that there are certain molecular mechanisms of resistance that just will result in treatment failures no matter what. And while much of the resistance that uh, we have in our chronically infecting pseudomonas populations are resistance that we as CF clinicians have created, there's a small minority of patients that may have acquired through horizontal transfer um, um, resistance determinants such as some of the new beta-lactamase beta genes that we're concerned about, whether they're the ESBLs or the KPCs or the um, VIMS and uh, NDM metallobeta-lactamases that can result in complete destruction of those drugs if used. Um, there was not a lot of work done in this area. The most recent uh, and uh, the, the largest study that was done was again out of France where they looked at molecular mechanisms of beta lactam resistance. And there we found only about 15% of people that had acquired mechanisms of resistance in terms of um, new beta lactamases, whether they were, uh, again, KPCs or the uh, um, uh, metallo beta lactamases. And um, certainly, if we are concerned about molecular mechanisms of resistance that uh, relate to the acquisition of genes, it's really important that we work with our uh, microbiology laboratories and to make sure that they're actually screening for these. So there are a number of both PCR assays as well as lateral flow assays that can be used to confirm the presence of some of these enzymes. Again, um, the KPCs and the uh, metallobeta-lactamases are the ones that we talk about the most within the infectious disease world, but we also have these emerging, uh, in particular, OXA48 that are great concerned. Um, and, and here's where some of our newer agents can come into play. Uh, we had this uh, wasteland in treating pseudomonas between, I think it was about 93 and 2013, where there were no new drugs introduced. Um, and then all of a sudden, we've had this rapid uh, introduction of a number of different agents, and we have to try and find their place. Um, so, um, Ceftaz avibactam, as well as Astrianem avibactam, uh, Miropenem uh, vaborobactam, and Imipenem relobactam, as well as Septolazone tazobactam, which isn't prescribed separately than the tazobactam that we've had access to for quite some time. So, I'm just going to make a couple points. So, I did my infectious disease training in 2015, and they made me sad because suddenly I had to learn all these newer agents, and these were the tables that haunted us for our uh, board exams. <laughs> um, but I think <clears throat> the other key point is that uh, a lot of the a lot of these bacterial organisms that infect people with CF uh, have rapid ability to acquire resistance to inc newer agents as well and so I think it's again speaks to the point that simply adding more antibiotics or changing them isn't necessarily going to be the thing that determines whether someone improves or not excellent um, I, I imagine mostly what we're dealing with in our CF population are our um, endogenous AMPCs, which have been deregulated and, and hyper-expressed in most of our patients. And again, the minority will have actually acquired something that's going to hopefully be a, a particularly rare event. But again, um, some of these drugs can come to the rescue, in particular for um, um, restoring a function of our traditional antimicrobial agents. Um, Ceftolazone tazobactam in particular is one that uh, um, gets a, a fair bit more use um, and that's uh, because again it works for uh, multiple mechanisms in that um, it's good for both uh, um, being a very very weak inducer of the AMP-C beta lactamase that's endogenous in our pseudomonas and it's a weak um, efflux pump substrate such that what gets into the cell actually stays there and it's not terribly dependent on outer membrane proteins to actually bring it in. Um, and what we can see in uh, a population from, um, I think this was Australia, um, was that uh, a, a lot of the agents that had uh, um, little activity against chronically infecting pseudomonads from people with CF did have um, um, higher levels of uh, activity when uh, septolazone tazobactam was actually used. Um, and we have some studies looking at pharmacokinetics in the adult CF population. Um, which, again, um, are encouraging and demonstrate 
that uh, um, for organisms even with the higher MIC values that uh, um, we can have significant activities. And finally, the, the latest and greatest that uh, um, we're all a little more enamored with is Cifriterocol, um, which uh, has terrible challenges to get, at least in Canada. Um, we have to get it directly from Japan, and certainly it's not very good for people who are acutely ill. Um, but what Cifriterocol is, is something that's been worked on since the 80s in terms of a, um, a, a linking between um, chemicals that look like siderophores and our traditional um, antibiotics to use that Trojan horse analogy to get them back into the cell. So Pseudomonas in particular produces a number of siderophores uh, and in particular pyokelin and Cifriterocol has this uh, uh, chlorocatechol moiety right here which looks almost exactly like, um, like it uh, and allowing it to be taken up into the cell and then the uh, agent, the uh, uh, cephalosporin, is very, very similar to both ciftazidime and cefepime and has, of course, a, uh, a spectrum of activity that's quite effective against pseudomonas. And it is very resistant to beta-lactamase um, um, destruction. And as a result, it even uh, resists the metallo-beta-lactamase or the class B uh, beta-lactamases that we're concerned about. And as a result, when you look at cefiterocol, you can see that um, the uh, minimal inhibitor concentrations uh, are pushed very, very much to the left, um, which demonstrates much greater activity against many pseudomonas isolates from people with CF. The only time I tried to get cefidericol was on Christmas Day, and it turns out, um, and it was for a really sick person in the ICU, and it turns out that you have to do all of these forms, but then you actually have to create a legal contract, so trying to contact university legal offices on Christmas Day is, <laughs> is not fun. <laughs> um, as have many people used Cifriterocol in uh, CF patients? <clears throat> not yet. What about in non-CF oh, patients? One, yes. Oh, we have one, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, what, one of the things that we were going to talk about as well is uh, dual beta-lactam therapies. Um, are many people in pseudomonas infected patients using multiple beta-lactams uh, at the same time? There's a yes over there. Okay. So, so certainly there's, there, there's not a, a lot of evidence for this practice and forever it had in fact been discouraged in the infectious disease teaching literature uh, because of the potential for drug-drug interactions and antagonism. But if you actually dig into the literature, it's not very well supported at all. Um, and for whatever antagonism or synergy actually means in the host. Um, what we do know is that many of the beta-lactam drugs that we use have actually different um, targets. For example, uh, the monobactams and cephalosporins are very, very much focused on penicillin binding protein 3 uh, in Pseudomonas ruginosa. Whereas things like uh, meropenem and the uretopenicillin um, uh, piperacillin have kind of a more balanced uh, action against, you know, two, three, and four as the penicillin biting protein targets. So you can spread um, activity against your heterogeneous population of Pseudomonas ruginosa and recognizing that there's the, uh, um, um, a mixed population that's going to produce different mechanisms of resistance. Um, what we do see in some in vitro models is that there is very commonly additive effects between beta-lactam antibiotics um, and very occasionally synergy. Uh, synergy is often noted with estreenam and cefepime uh, as a, a particular combination. Um, so we use dual beta-lactams not terribly uncommonly um, in our sicker patients. Um, and I think with the exception of eosinophilia, which we observe very commonly as a result of that, um, we, we don't see any, any significant negative consequences. Um, I would also add that outside of CF, you know, there's growing experience using dual beta-lactam antibiotics for other serious infections. Yeah. And so, um, so for like serious enterococcal infections yeah. where patients can't tolerate immunoglycosides, a lot of times people are using ceftriaxone in addition to ampicillin. Yeah. And I think like, I think in Canada or at least in Calgary, it used to be more of aminoglycoside based regimens for enterococcal infections. And I think over time, based on the U.S. experience, it's switching more to dual beta-lactam therapy. Um, with the only comment being that there is the potential for harm, um, high-dose beta-lactam therapies do associate with reduced seizure threshold, um, and using multiple at the same time can cause problems. So you just have to be mindful in terms of dosing. Um, what about uh, co-infections? So uh, Dr. Thornton, you put together uh, uh, an article here 
um, showing um, um, the spectrum of activity of many commonly used drugs in SIA. How do you look at co-infections? Well, first and foremost, I'm very fortunate to work in a center with infectious disease colleagues in the CF clinic. So that's number one. Um, but yeah, in terms of co-infections, I think there's several things we've learned from culture data as well as culture independent data or microbiome data. And it's really getting back to that principle around how, you know, with the anti-susceptibility profiles, it's a very not natural environment the way we're testing it. And so I think you have to be mindful of the other organisms present, the potential for acquisition of genetic resistance markers through horizontal gene transfer, for example. Um, and I think just going back to those basic concepts we talked about if a patient's not responding. So we put together with uh, Dr. Parkins as well as the senior author, we put together this little um, figure here in our paper just to try and give a roadmap because it can get quite complicated quite quickly. Um, and just as we close out on our pseudomonas discussion, we'll just mention phage therapy has been discussed a lot at this particular conference. Um, we as a team haven't had any particular experience with phage therapy for multi-resistant pseudomonas, but there have been several case reports, a few case series um, that have been published in the CF literature. And at ID Week, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Boston, uh, the results of a phase one, two study were presented uh, there on a, uh, um, a pharmaceutical formulation of phage for uh, CF use, uh, which demonstrated safety in that population. I just wanted to know if I fixed my patient yet. <laughs> otherwise, I'm never, okay. otherwise I'm okay. never going to be consulted. Uh, yeah. While we're changing, is there any questions or comments from people's experience or any other thoughts? If the susceptibility doesn't have correlation with the outcome, does it make sense to look at the susceptibility? <laughs> I mean, I think that's a fair question. One question that I would like to ask you all maybe to raise your hands is, who has micro labs that are still doing routine susceptibility testing on all their CF isolates? Interesting. Um, and I, yes, it's debatable as to how useful that is to get on all of your a micro results, but I think that there is some suggestion based on the um, susceptibility patterns that you see that you can get some hint as to whether or not there's an enzymatic um, mechanism underlying that resistance. And I think we would all agree that if there is an enzymatic cause for the resistance, you're probably more likely to have failure with that an antibiotic that's susceptible to that enzyme. So. Our lab, for instance, doesn't routinely do um, susceptibility testing on all of the cultures, but if we, and it also doesn't routinely do molecular testing to look for um, enzymatic mechanisms of resistance. But if we see patterns that are consistent with that, that's something that we can ask for. So I think there's some utility still in that, yeah. at least from my perspective, but getting it every time is probably not that much, not that helpful because a lot of times you'll see an MIC's twofold higher, twofold less. And what does that really mean? And especially when those twofold up and down are right around the, the susceptibility kind of cutoffs, is that really meaningful? Yeah. And I think that that's sometimes when we need to step back and probably provide some additional perspective that says, you know, that it probably doesn't make much difference in this setting, um, whether or not the MIC is four or eight, because a lot of people then are potentially just looking at the um, the S or the R interpretation that they might be seeing. And the other thing to keep in mind is that um, uh, it's probably sometimes even more difficult for people to interpret Kirby Bauer disk zones um, because those numbers don't actually correlate directly with, uh, with MICs, right? And so the, you have to have some sense of perspective on those things. So that would be my kind of additional input. I don't know if you guys have anything else to add. Well, that would be one point. The other point is that uh, there are some uh, the other issue is that that is, uh, that is a test in vitro. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that are going on when you say the patient is the immunity of the patient and the different metabolic cartoon of the drug structure in the individual patient. Yeah. Uh, in my own experience, I have patients you know, with pseudomonas that are resistant to all the panel of antibiotics. By those, by what, what can you do in that situation when you just give the routine, you know, say, that the patient has responded before. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, uh, tobramycin and ceftazidine, and then the patient gets better. And that is the other uh, question that the results of those studies is just uh, a general idea. But I think that this is uh, uh, 
the point to individualize more the, the treatment rather than to extrapolate those results on an individual patient. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just for those of you that didn't hear it, it was really talking about um, his comment was about individualizing therapy and so tailoring patient tailoring therapies to the patient and not just rate based on susceptibility results. And so I think, um, again, the in vitro susceptibility tests don't take into account patient factors, um, including immune status and so forth. And, and using historical data of did they respond to this antibiotic, then they might be likely to do so again. And, and just one final comment, we've seen where antibiogram directed therapy has probably resulted in worse patient outcomes. Uh, for example, the Liverpool epidemic strain of Pseudomonas ruginosa, which is endemic in obviously in the UK and in parts of Canada, um, is quite uh, commonly resistant to many beta-lactam drugs and very commonly people were treating it with both um, high dose aminoglycosides, either the, the more nephrotoxic gentamicin or more recently tobramycin in combination with colistin. Um, and what we were seeing was very high rates of nephrotoxicity. And they've done some great work in UK showing, of course, that there is a, 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 a renal memory in CF and that the additive effects of multiple, multiple, multiple weeks of um, nephrotoxic agents do catch up to us eventually um, and are predisposing our patients to long-term negative renal outcomes. And, it, and I think we even overlook vestibular toxicity as a whole because we really don't have good ways to measure it. So, go ahead. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I, I, again, we often use it with an aminoglycoside if someone is sick, and certainly um, before the days of ETI we were. Um, did we need to? I think there would be a very good argument to say we didn't, and we exposed our patients to um, an unnecessary nephrotoxin um, at the time. But um, <laughs> it is in the CF literature, right? It's in our blood. Um, and, and getting away from aminoglycosides is going to be a, quite a challenge. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to case two, which um, uh, we decided to include a case um, with mycobacterioides um, abscessus. Um, infection. So this is a 17-year-old um, female with mild CF lung disease whose baseline FEV1 is 92% and chronic MSSA infection who has a new screening sputum culture that positive for mycobacterium abscessus, which is 2 plus positive on smear and grew at 5 days. Um, she reports cough and symptoms are, are at her normal baseline. And so um, <clears throat> the first question is what would, we, what would you want to do at this point for this patient? Scream and ask for help. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think that's fair yeah. enough. That's what everybody always wants to do in this situation. Um, but I think the important thing to keep in mind is that, um, that she's not having any symptoms at this point, and you have time to figure things out. Yeah. So, um, but when this comes up in clinic, there's a discussion about, well, I previously had Pseudomonas a, quite a while back and also had MRSA and had undergone eradication therapy for the, both of those. Is there any role for trying to eradicate this abscessus? Go ahead, Dr. Perkins. <laughs> I'm still treating my pseudomonas patients, so I'll defer this one. Yeah, this is a tough one, and I think if you've been in, in, in CF long enough, you've treated nobody, you've treated everybody, and now you're stuck somewhere in the middle trying to figure out who to treat. Um, and, and certainly that's the position I've been in. I've certainly poisoned more people than I've helped when it comes to obsessive stuff. Um, and I would say at this point, we'll get to this in a minute, but we have one positive culture, the patient doesn't have any symptoms, and there's no real data for eradication and abscessus. And so I think that, uh, again, I think we need to pause, yeah. gather some more information and kind of decide where we're going, so. And I think even if we looked at the guidelines, they would suggest getting at least two samples if yep. it's expectorated sputum. So maybe just starting there and getting some imaging. And so, and that's where we are now. So um, it's actually been two months now, although now she's symptomatic, her FEV1 has dropped. Um, just to make things a little bit more dramatic. For routine culture, she's still only really culturing MSSA as far as pathogens go, but she now has, um, you tried to get a few more sputum cultures and she dropped off even a couple more. Um, they're all, three of them have been smear positive at this point. And you decided to tr treat for traditional pathogens. And in this instance, somebody chose um, Ampsilbactam and she, she was hospitalized briefly, got some increased airway clearance, finished some therapy at home, and still really isn't doing any better. Got a CT that showed some nodules. 
um, and a tree and bud pattern that's potentially consistent with the NTM um, clinical diagnostics that you need. And, um, and so now we have multiple positive cultures, clinical symptoms that we don't have another explanation for, and radiographic findings that are potentially, that are consistent with NTM lung disease. So what do you guys think at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think this I think she likes she likely warrants treatment, but with that said, um, these treatments are long and complex. Mm -hmm. So, as much as you know, you want to start treatment today. It's not going to be today because partly it's a conversation and maybe multiple conversations about where they are in life. She's seventeen. I don't know if she's graduating high school right now, and she wants to you know go through that first. Um, often they're hospitalized for many weeks. Um, so I think it's often a multi-level discussion often with the support it, like parents or care, care providers, et cetera, whoever their support system is to discuss, um, the implications, the prognosis, all that's involved so that it's like an informed decision to be made. And I would wholeheartedly agree with all of that because, um, in this setting, if the, um, patients and, in this instance, parents are interested in starting therapy, they really need to understand what a commitment that is. Because it's not, yeah. I mean, up until this point, maybe they've had experience with, you know, exacerbations from staph or pseudomonas, which is maybe a couple of weeks of antibiotics, and that's not what we're talking about. Yeah. And so if they're not on board with understanding what the implication is of starting treatment and how long they're really going to have to give it a good try to see if it's actually making any improvement in symptoms, um, you're setting yourself up for a lot of difficulties. Um, I would also add that there's another piece of information that's really key to having an informed conversation about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, and so that piece of additional information is that it really does make a difference in this setting to know the macrolide sensitivity status of the mycobacterium obsessus isolate that you're talking about. And because that has a lot of implications about how likely um, you are to be successful in treating this organism if you're trying to eradicate it, um, how many agents you're going to need to use, how many of them might need to be IV, what the potential toxicities are. And so that is really a key piece of information that you need to have an informed conversation. And I would say that this is one of the pieces of information where we actually have a little bit better data. Admittedly, a lot of it is um, retrospective, um, and there, but we have a lot of data from outside the setting of CF and also from some um, from within the CF um, patient population. And really, there's <clears throat> two forms of macrolide resistance that can exist in um, the mycobacterium obsessus group. One is the um, inducible ERM41 gene, which um, exists on the chromosome and has a, a mechanism for inducing resistance on exposure to macrolides. Um, and so that's something that may not be picked up if you just did routine MIC testing without holding um, the sample in the presence of macrolides for a full two weeks. So there's various techniques that the micro lab can do to determine that, or you need to do molecular testing to identify the, ERM for, the presence of a functional ERM41 gene. It largely correlates with species, so Mycobacterium obsessus, subspecies obsessus is actually going to, is the majority of the time going to have a functional ERM gene, um, and Mycelians is not because it has a deletion in it, but there is a subset of uh, Mycobacterium obsessus that actually has a single nucleotide substitution that inactivates the gene. So having this information in hand really can inform that um, discussion. And so I would say other AST testing might be helpful, but there's much less evidence about how useful that's actually going to be in um, determining your response to treatment in this setting. Um, and um, what I would say is that there's some evidence to suggest that high levels of amikacin resistance are correlated with amikacin being less useful in seeing a clinical response. Um, it's less likely that you're going to see high level amikacin resistance in a new infection in a patient, but since there is documented transmission from patient to patient in some centers and um, <clears throat> through some of these kind of uh, global clones that have potentially spread, there's a small possibility that that might be the case. So that is an additional piece of information that might help you kind of think about what your options are for treatment. But we do need more data in the treatment of mycobacterium abscessus um, as far as what antibiotics um, are effective linked to some of this, uh, some molecular information and maybe some phenotypic information. So, um, so in this patient, then we go ahead and see that they, it is subspecies obsessus and has a functional ERM41 gene. So with inducible macrolide resistance. So essentially, although it, essentially we end up treating it like an MDR organism because it has so much intrinsic resistance to begin with. And so, and you will have all seen this before, but 
the current guideline really recommends two phases of therapy for mycobacterium abscessus, and part of that is based on experience, and part of that is based on the practicalities of trying to treat these patients, um, in that there's usually intensive upfront therapy that involves uh, multiple IV antibiotics, followed by a continuation phase where you potentially are transitioning to oral and inhaled antibiotics. Um, and given that this patient has a macrolide resistant strain based on um, an inducible ERM gene, you really normally want to start with three to four active agents is the recommendation. And a lot of people would include azithromycin in the regimen, um, but it doesn't actually count as one of your active agents. So, and then in the continuation phase, you'd probably want three active drugs. Um, so here's our list of, I'm, and I'm going to do a poll at this point. Great. Here's our list of agents that we potentially have to choose from, all of which have lovely side effects and where we don't, I will admit, totally know which ones are going to be the most effective. Um, this is like the smarty party nobody wants to be at. I know. <laughs> but, um, and, and maybe we can participate along with you guys. So let's say we're going to try and pick. So like I said, we're starting a regimen for this patient and we're trying to get at least three active agents and we'll, let's just assume that we kind of have run of the mill susceptibility testing, but we know that it's macrolide resistant. So um, how many people would consider including azithromycin up front? Um, clarithromycin instead of azithromycin? Amicacin IV? Um, amicacin nebulized? Um, imipenem up front, cefoxetin. Or, yeah, one of the two. Or, yeah, or, and uh, ticocycline, or aromatocycline. Maybe. Yeah, I would say if, either one of if those. If I could get it. <laughs> um, clofazamine. Two. Linazolid, tadazolid, bedaquiline. Moxifloxacin. Okay, a mix of it's a like, mix of options. Just throw your darts. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We, basically, we turn into weather people where we don't. I, yeah. Like, let's just pick and choose. Um, so <laughs> let's just say that we end up deciding on azithromycin, IV amicacin, imipenem, and tigacycline up front because we're interested in getting amatocycline, but we can't quite get it yet. I don't think we're ever going to get it inpatient, frankly, um, which is where they need to be to start <laughs> therapy. So there is some data, and it's not really very good, but people have tried to make an attempt to go back and look at what um, individual antibiotics that have been included in regimens might actually have some potential benefit in, um, in therapy. And so there was one uh, uh, patient-level meta-analysis that was published in the European Respiratory Journal that had some signal to suggest that there was potential benefit for including um, azithromycin, imipenem, and amicacin. And I will say that this... Uh, analysis kind of predated tigacycline actually being available. So there was, I think, only two patients that were included in that meta-analysis. Um, there was also a single center study that came out of um, Shanghai that suggested, again, that the pattern of antibiotics that potentially offered some benefit was um, very similar. Um, I think that there's also um, potentially we're going to get some additional information from some of the trials that are kind of ongoing now. Um, it's debatable as to whether or not we're going to have a high enough end um, for some of them to actually kind of draw firm conclusions, but at least we'll also have some better sense of what the side effects are that limit the use of those therapies. So, for instance, the patient's trial that's being run out of National Jewish Health across multiple centers in CF patients, and then the format trial is actually designed to look at some of these questions about whether or not there's benefit of using um, some of these agents. So, for instance, there's with and without clofazamine, there's amicacin that's either IV or neb um, nebulized um, included in that study. So we'll actually have some direct head-to-head um, -head comparisons. So your patient is in the hospital and starting on these medications, and then you start to have problems with serious nausea and emesis. I think we've all found ourselves in this position before. <laughs> Never happens. <laughs> um, no, I'm such a good doctor that I would have started them on all the antiemetics first. All the antiemetics, <laughs> exactly. But so in this particular instance, not surprisingly, tigacycline, as we all know, is a terrible offender for causing nausea. Um, Sorry. What? Do you recommend to do like baseline uh, uh, EKG yeah, or any evaluation to see if there is any uh, cardiac problem in 
Um, I certainly would. Um, I will say we get a little bit to some of the toxicity. So the question was about um, whether or not we should get a baseline EKG and do other monitoring to see. And I have to say, I left that out of the discussion here up front, but I would certainly get um, some upfront studies. And part of that's going to depend on what medications you're actually including in your regimen. Um, and so, and we'll get to some of that a little bit later on. But I would say pr almost certainly I would usually get a baseline EKG and um, you're probably going to want liver and um, kidney function and um, upfront kind of uh, uh, blood counts. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so I think that, so this was one of the things that we wanted to talk about related to this case is that a lot of times when we're using medications for mycobacterium obsessus, but also some of the other medications that we would use to treat MDR organisms, some of them cause a lot of nausea. And I think that it's particularly problematic for mycobacterium obsessus because we're often using multiple medications that cause nausea together. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to really be more proactive about anticipating that many of our patients are going to become profoundly nauseous to the point that it may limit their ability to take these medications at all and that we need to actually do multiple things proactively up front to try and address that. And so I think the first thing we need to do is set expectations. And I usually like to have a conversation with my parents that this, I mean, with parents and patients, that this is basically essentially chemotherapy for a serious infection that we're trying to treat. And we need to actually approach it in that way. So the oncology doctors don't usually wait to give antiemetics until after their patient has gotten nauseous because it's more problematic. Once you've kind of activated the nausea centers, getting the nausea back under control is difficult. And they also don't use just one agent. So I think that the goal really should be to control the nausea before you start giving the medications, adopt strategies to actually try and um, control the nausea as you're introducing the medicines. And then I would also say that if you can, start medications together that you are not usually associated with very much nausea, and then try and induce the ones that are kind of more nausea causing um, over a relatively short period of time, but not all at once, so that you can identify if one of them is more problematic to try and sort some of that out. And I would also say that you probably, or at least in my personal practice, in patients who are going to be on regimens like this, I usually start with at least two scheduled antiemetics, yeah. and you can peel them off if they're not having any nausea. But if they're having a little bit of nausea and they are tolerating it, then they stay on those two. If they're still having symptoms, then you need to readdress whether or not you can actually add something else. And um, our CF clinical pharmacist has been extremely helpful in helping us to identify um, antiemetics that are actually, um, that we can add when we're actually having problems. And we actually need to kind of step back and use some of the antiemetics that they are using on the oncology service, but we're not used to using off of, like on the other, in the other wards in the hospital. So I would say, you know, in addition to undigancitron, we've had some better luck with granicitron, um, and then, and some of the other agents. I would say often we end up with patients on scopolamine patches, um, I've found dronabinol to be helpful in some patients. Um, it's sometimes tricky with pediatric patients who can have some, who can get a little high off of it, I would <laughs> say. And so, but it also is helpful in that it's appetite stimulating. And if they have some low level of nausea that you're not actually able to control, getting some of that appetite stimulation is also probably going to help them um, uh, recover from this infection if you're actually able, able to maintain reasonable nutrition. I don't know if anybody else has any that other. That sounds great. I agree. Can I ask a question? So when you're doing this regimen with all these multiple QT prolonging mm -hmm. drugs, do you have any guidance on how often we should be monitoring ECGs or routine? I mean, so I would say that some of that, uh, some of the monitoring for ECGs depends a bit on kind of the half-life of some of the medications, which will come up a little bit later on um, as to what the concern is. But I would say up front, if we're starting multiple medications, usually the patients in the hospital, I would say we often will get an EKG like, you know, at baseline and then after starting a couple of them, and then we probably would check it, I would say maybe twice or three times in the first week and make sure we're not running into trouble and then we can start to space things out. If you're on a medication that's really accumulating over time, then I think we need to think about being um, checking it more frequently um, even after they get out of the hospital until we feel like they've kind of, uh, kind of reached a steady state. And I think in some ways we've been lucky. Um, that might not be the best word, but I'll go with it anyways, in that many of our people with CF that we've treated are young and yep. have good hearts, right? And so it's often not the biggest concern. But as we have with an aging population, so if we encounter older people with CF that get this infection, I think that will be trickier. 
And I will say that I, of course, have a bias as a pediatrician, so most of my patients are younger. Yeah. <laughs> their kidneys work better. They're not having as many heart problems. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd also just comment it's really important in this uh, period of time to be watching uh, electrolyte balance very closely and really pushing potassium and magnesium to make making sure that people are at the, the upper limit of normal in case that QTC gets pretty long in hospital, which yeah. unfortunately it can do. Mm -hmm. Um, so just a brief discussion, because tegacycline does cause so much nausea, one of the questions is always like, why are we actually including this? So part, there's a lot of people who actually would try and include tegacycline and aromatocycline up front, and that's because it's amongst the agents with the best in vitro activity, with the caveat, again, that we don't know exactly how that correlates with, um, <laughs> with outcomes. But the flip side of that is that for mycobacterium abscessus, like a bunch of the other agents, the MI, like the actual in vitro activity is terrible. So um, we're always happy to at least have something that has some in vitro activity that might look like it has some ability to actually treat the organism on its own. Um, but the evidence is really largely limited to um, expert opinion. Um, Omatocycline is an, is an attractive alternative to a lot of people because patients are normally going to be on these regimens for a long period of time, and it's something that um, there's an IV or an oral formulation potentially available, um, but it's important to keep in mind that with the oral formulation, absorption um, can be decreased significantly if it's given with a meal, and that's even worse with uh, meals containing calcium, and we're often encouraging our patients to eat like calorie-dense dairy foods or something like that, and that's a problem if you're actually trying to get the levels of amitocycline that you're trying to um, that you think are going to be more effective. Um, the nausea may be a little bit less pronounced with amatocycline than it is with tigacycline, but it's still a significant issue. Um, and the cost can be quite prohibitive in many instances, and so um, insurance may not be that willing to pay for it. But um, with regard to, so there was recently a, um, an attempt at doing some systematic review of the evidence um, for amatocycline in um, treating rapidly growing mycobacterial infections. And I would say, like I said, a lot of it is scant case series, but you can see um, that it does tend to be, amatocycline is broadly active against rapidly growing mycobacteria, but also some of the other organisms that we think about being drug resistant, including MRSA, VRE, some of the ESBL organisms and such. And then there are, like I said, a case series that report um, act their use in mycobacterium abscessus infections, both in CF and uh, non-CF patients. But again, they're really very small still. And so I would, there's probably some people who have had as much experience using omatocycline to treat these infections as they might be able to find when they're going through PubMed. But hopefully we'll have more <laughs> systemic data coming up. So as this patient's case continues, um, she's completed 16 weeks of IV imi imipenem, amikacin, and then oral azithromycin and omatocycline. So um, she was able to get out of the hospital and transition from tigacycline to omatocycline. Um, her cultures have been AFB smear negative at this point, um, and she's had two negative cultures, but also two positive cultures since starting therapy that took longer to grow, this time two to three weeks of incubation in the lab. She, however, is tired of having a PIC line in place and having to do IV, multiple IV uh, med administrations at home. And, um, and this is something that comes up in pediatrics. You know, she would like to go swimming and hang out with her friends over the summer, and you can't do that. And you're not going to be going swimming in the lake if you have a PIC line in. And so she asked to stop her IV medications. And so what non-IV agents would you consider using at this point? And we'll do another raise of hands. So we'll assume that she's going to continue the oral agents that she's already on, azithromycin and omatocycline. Um, but so how many people would consider adding um, liposomal or non-liposomal amikacin at this point by nebulization? And then how many people would consider clofazamine as an oral agent? Um, linazolid? Uh, Tadizolid? Bedaclin? Get it. Um, moxifloxacin? or none, you try and convince her to, she's doing okay on this regimen, she's not having any toxicity, do you really need to go swimming or should we push forward with this? I mean, I've had those conversations with yeah. patients and sometimes, it, but often it's like after eight weeks and I'm like, well, can we make it till summer when yeah. you wanna be on summer vacation and not have this pick line in? Cause you're yeah. doing okay and I think that you're on probably some of the more active agents that we have available. So let's just say in this instance, in this instance, we collaboratively decide between 
the clinical team and the family and the patient that she's going to go on azithromycin, amatocycline, linazolid, and liposomal amicase and MEBS. Um, and then four months later, at the end of summer vacation, she's back in school. She hasn't really come into clinic exactly like she should have, and is now complaining of burning or a tingling sensation in her toes and feet, and the labs show that she has some moderate anemia. So I will say at this point, um, one of the issues with toxicity monitoring in patients who are on treatment for mycobacterium abscessus is that when things are going fine, they don't think very much about it. And um, it really is um, dependent on us as clinicians to keep reminding them that toxicity can come up at any point, and really we need to have a schedule that we kind of agree on and that everybody's, that people are going to be participating in. So I chose linazolid and tadizolid as an example here for toxicity that can kind of come up in part because it's one of the things that we can't necessarily monitor all the toxicity um, using laboratory-based methods. But the things that we worry about are, of course, cytopenias, and it can be any of the cell lines, um, and peripheral and optic neuropathy. And in particular, I would say I have had multiple teenagers who have run into problems with peripheral neuropathy because they stop coming to clinic, and no matter how many times you tell them, if you get numbness or tingling or other kind of burning sensation, they will come in and say, oh, well, this has been going on for two months. And you're like, okay, great. So let's, but so we have limited experience really in using linazolid for longer periods of duration from the original clinical trials because it was designed for like skin and soft tissue infections and other things where people are going to maybe be taking it for, you know, 10 days. Mm -hmm. But there is more experience from um, multidrug resistant tuberculosis where it was actually included in regimens um, and used for longer periods of time, right? So there's, so for, in, for instance, um, one study in South Africa that was observational looked at um, regimens that included linazolid because it had been shown to be effective in MDRTB, and they were using 600 milligrams daily, and they saw that of um, uh, more than 100 patients, 21% of the patients needed to stop linazolid altogether, and 21% needed to have a dose um, interruption and reduction. Um, and they also were able to see that the, um, they were able to describe the time frame that they started to see toxicity that developed. And so here, um, you can see that, uh, so the green line is neuropathy, and it really kind of the majority of the cases came up, oops, sorry, the majority of the cases came up over um, the first, mm, you know, four to six months or so. And the same thing was also true for anemia. Um, so a lot of times you're really going to see it in the first six months, and if a patient's tolerating it, the chances of it developing do go down somewhat. Um, it, there's also additional data from some of the other more recent trials um, uh, looking at using linazolid for multidrug resistant TB. And so one of those was the NICS TB trial, which was a little more than um, 100 patients in the original trial. And they used some um, pharmacokinetic and pharmacotoxologic modeling to try and predict which patients were likely to get um, toxicity from linazolid, what was going to be the most problematic, what kinds of things they could actually use to predict um, toxicity. And what I would say is that in general, the modeling data that was available suggested that routine monitoring of drug levels that people might be able to do in a regular clinical setting is probably going to be challenging. Um, there's some other data that suggests that maybe measuring a linazolid trough might be informative. That may be true, but they found, at least from their modeling data, they found that um, actually just measuring a CBC and if you saw a 10% drop in hemoglobin would actually predict a lot of the patients who are going to run into problems with anemia, and that um, monitoring for neuropathy using a simple kind of clinical tool was actually as helpful as any of the lab um, data that they could collect. But what they, they surprisingly were using 1,200 milligrams a day, and 81% of the patients had neuropathy. So I would say, you know, on, the, on those high doses, especially in adults, you're probably going to run into more problems. I would say in kids, we sometimes, you're going to run into problems sometimes, but probably not as often as in adults, but it's still quite possible. So at this point, the patient says they're done with linazolid. They, this burning sensation, they don't want to try a dose interruption and dose reduction or anything. They are not interested. And at the same time, um, they've had some, some of their follow-up AFB cultures. They've had, they're now all consistently smear negative, but of the last, the last three cultures have still been positive for mycobacterium abscessus, admittedly still growing um, very slowly. Um, and the most recent culture, there's no molecular evidence of resistance to amicacin. So what would you recommend at this point? Well, we're ditching the linazolid, <laughs> and then we're going to go back to our drawing board and see what's left in yeah. our arsenal. 
So I think that's, a, so it's a chance to kind of reassess. And so I would say in addition to the, having to make a adjustment because of the nasal toxicity, I would also say at this point that, you know, your patient is basically experiencing microbiologic failure. They're still having, even if the burden of organisms has gone down, um, they still have not actually converted their sputum cultures. And so generally with mycobacteria, if you're going to make a change for microbiologic failure, you should probably be changing at least two drugs. So we have a couple options at this point. So who would consider restarting IV? I would say it's certainly a consideration. Um, I'm not sure that this patient's going to go for it at the moment based on um, what's been going on. So who would consider bedaquiline in this instance? What about clofazamine? Um, there's some in vitro data that suggests dual beta lactam antibiotics can have some activity, but those would also have to be IV. Um, any other ideas that people would have at this point? All right, so just to emphasize, so a little brief discussion on each of these agents. So bedaquiline is really an agent that was developed, it's a diarrheal quinolone that um, was kind of the whole, it was the first new class of anti-tubercular antibiotics really for uh, many years. And it's been approved for MDR and XDR TB, and it has limited distribution in the United States. It is very expensive. Um, and some TB trials had an increased risk of death, of which it's unclear why exactly, but that's still a conversation that you need to have with your patient, which can be a little bit awkward. <laughs> how, like, how commonly are people able to access it here? Like, is it available in most centers? Okay. I, I was gonna say, did you see a hand go up? I didn't see it. I just saw some nods. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. I would say we generally have had reasonable success at accessing it, but it does involve jumping through various hoops. Um, it uh, can also be a QT prolonging organism, and it does tend to have a very long half-life. Very, very long half-life. <laughs> um, clofazamine, um, here in the U.S. it's only available by IND for NTM disease. Um, there's no real clinical trial data. It does appear to be pretty active in vitro against Mycobacterium abscessus. Um, there was a large case series that was published out of Colorado that, suggests, that looked at a mix of patients who had NTM lung disease, but a fair number of them had Mycobacterium abscessus. And, um, and 78% uh, of them had failed prior therapy. Of the 36 abscessus patients in that trial who had, at the time of publication, tolerated um, at least six months of uh, clofazamine therapy, 50% of them had converted their cultures to um, negative, which is um, promising. It has a kind of different set of side effects, I would say. So it does, it, it also has a very long half-life and tends to deposit in tissues. Um, so you can get skin discoloration, a corneal deposits, a whole host of other things, and is also associated in some patients with GI intolerance. From the pediatric perspective, I would say it also comes, is only available as little gelatin capsules that you're, according to the manufacturer, not supposed to open. And so if you have a patient who can't take pills or has issues with particular textures of pills, that can also be problematic. Um, and like I said, it also has a really long half-life. Um, one of the things that I, um, the skin discoloration issue really can be problematic in some patients because it can cause generalized bronzing, but it can also cause irregular kind of patches, which can be very distressing for patients. It is reversible, um, but it takes a long time for them to show up generally and a long time for them to go away. And uh, when starting this medication, I will also say that um, in some patients that has caused some um, suicidal thoughts because it can cause such severe depression and other social anxiety. And so um, it's important to kind of discuss all of those things and again, kind of set expectations, which I think are important. So you start both of those. So you decide to start clofazamine and bedaquiline in addition to the azithromycin, amicacin, and liposomal amicacin, or amatocycline um, and liposomal amicacin. And then you start to see the QT interval is creeping up. So <laughs> any thoughts at this point? I mean, again, as Dr. Parkinson had mentioned, I would try to optimize the electrolytes as well to see if that can help things. And then again, uh, we might have to change drugs again. We might, <laughs> I would say, and I would say, I probably at this point when I would try and optimize electrolytes and the azithromycin isn't really an active agent. Yep. So I would probably just peel that off at this right. point. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's say you do that, you try and optimize electrolytes the QT interval improves, and the patient remains on amicacin, amatocycline, bedaquiline, and clofazamine. So now they've gone 12 months, 
They have negative AFB sputum cultures. Their FEV1 has improved. It's not quite back at their baseline before all of this and no other symptoms. This, their chest CT is also much better. There's maybe some residual nodules, but they generally look like they've improved. There's no, there's no evidence of cavitary lesions that have developed in the interval and things are really looking much better. So now the question, when, <laughs> she wants to know when she can stop all these meds. And then are we, how do we feel about stopping them? Are we gonna stop them all at once or what, what are people's opinions? Do you wanna take this one? Yeah, so this is always a challenge <laughs> because obviously if you're following the pharmacokinetics of a drug, you would like to have this planned discussion. The problem is by the time patients are ready to be done, they're ready to be done. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the, the biggest issue. So you have to really prioritize what you wanna do. We've achieved our microbiologic outcome. Clinically, she's made a good response. And then you can rationalize with her. Are you ready to be done? Are you ready to do a, a tapered stop? Or are we gonna do a hard stop? Because the last thing you wanna do is take control on a row. Yeah, and I would agree. I, so, and there's not really um, consensus amongst uh, like the national experts, of which I am not counting myself one, um, about what to do in this situation. And part of the difficulty is that the way that bedaquilin was really initially approved for therapy and tuberculosis was it was used up front in really extended regimens, and then it was stopped before the rest of the regimen. And so that's part of where this debate comes in. Um, but there is no real firm answer. I think that the, I, the hope is that if you've achieved your microbiologic endpoint, and there's not actually evidence of ongoing active infection with abscesses, you're probably fine stopping all the medications at once. If, however, there's still a little bit of anxiety around the fact that, um, you know, you run the risk of losing um, some of these kind of key medications, both clofazamine and bedaquilin have a long half-life and maybe they'll wash each other out together so you'd still be on dual therapy. Um, but it's kind of an, it's going to be a point of discussion amongst yourselves and your colleagues, I guess. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's largely then a psychosocial discussion yeah. more so than because it's not about withdrawal symptoms or any of those things or harm by stopping everything at once. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going. Oh. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, three more cases. They're much faster. We'll just move through, kind of go over some highlights. Um, the, this, this next case is uh, an 11 year old male. Uh, with moderate CF lung disease, and he has pre-existing chronic pseudomonas infection and has been hospitalized for a pulmonary exacerbation. Within his hospitalization, he has sputum cultures three or four days in, which come up, and I yield a, a new MRSA acquisition. So uh, I guess the question to pose to the audience is, who does routine MRSA eradication now? Okay. Um, so... There's pros and cons in terms of MRSA eradication. Um, certainly pro is uh, the idea that it in the future has the potential to reduce chronic infection um, and the negative consequences associated with chronic infection, um, as well as the, the treatment burden associated with it. Um, the eradication regimens, there have been a couple that have been trialed in randomized control trials, um, and they're well established. Um, and the, the last big thing is once chronic infection does develop for MRSA, we, we do know that uh, a treatment and eradication is generally and largely unsuccessful, although not at the same rate as uh, um, we see with Pseudomonas ruginosa. Uh, the con, of course, is um, like many um, new uh, incident infections, many of them are transient and they clear very quickly. Um, we have randomized control trial data showing that uh, there is perhaps a, a short-term benefit, but we don't know if there's a long-term benefit. Um, and then, of course, there is the potential for drug-drug interactions, um, particularly in the context this person is now hospitalized um, and receiving other drugs, and we don't want to uh, interrupt those regimens. Um, so there, there's been two recent randomized trials for MRSA eradication, uh, one done in the States and one done in Italy. Uh, the regimens were pretty similar. One was um, Septra or uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or um, if someone is unable to tolerate the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, minocycline and rifampin, whereas the other one was uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and rifampin um, as a standard of care and only adjusted if there was in vitro resistance. Um, and then they used variably uh, associated regimens of nasal mupirocin, mouth chlorhexidine, body wash chlorhexidine, and environmental decamin decontamination. So the United States one did more of that than what was seen in Italy. And uh, what's important is both studies enrolled fewer than they intended and the dropout rates were a little higher. 
Um, the U.S. study was, in fact, prematurely terminated because of slow uh, accrual, uh, because I think many docs were actually doing MRSA eradication um, already. But what they did observe was at the predetermined study endpoint at 28 days that there was a higher rate of MRSA clearance in those that uh, had received the standardized regimen of oral antibiotics, nasal mupirocin, and uh, mouth rinse and body wash with chlorhexidine um, and environmental decontamination. So a higher rate at 28 days in the American study uh, and a lower rate that was observed at uh, six months in the Italian study, which again used some different uh, um, accessory treatments associated with it. Um, one of the things that um, um, we, we don't necessarily consider in the adult side as much as you do um, in the pediatric side is the role of the family as well as uh, potential harbingers and, and hosts for uh, MRSA. So um, that's certainly something that we do want to consider in our MRSA decolonization approaches. Um, and those family members may include two or four legs because obviously we see lots of uh, <laughs> transfer from the person to the pet and then the yeah. pet back to the person as a possibility. So that's certainly widely reported. Um, and if you are having challenges, those are important areas to consider. Um, the, the more important thing to, to talk about is the systemic therapies for MRSA, and, and Dr. Sumayaji has a particular uh, interest in this. She's involved in a number of clinical trials for uh, um, MRSA bacteremia. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts right now in terms of systemic therapies uh, in CF patients with exacerbations, in terms of preferred agents? Oh, with MRSA. Uh, I mean, I again, I think vancomycin is tested and true, but I think that if we have access to a beta-lactam, um, I would tend to use that if I'm allowed to, just because it's safer <laughs> in terms of a risk profile. So I think one of the higher generation cephalosporins probably would be my go-to. Um, and so just in the audience, is anybody using ceftaroline regularly? No. What about ceftobiprol for us Canadians? So ceftobiprol is a, a fantastic drug from a, a CF perspective in that it gets our two main pathogens in that particular situation. So it has the same activity as cefepime uh, against Pseudomonas, as well as um, its MRSA-related activity. And it's the only antibiotic that's administered as a prodrug. Um, and as it, so it's administered as ceftobibrol metacryl. And um, when it's hydrolyzed, uh, most patients, and it's almost always the CF patients, that complain of the uh, caramel taste in the mouth associated with it. So that's a, an important thing. Um, and it's likely to come to the States soon. Uh, there was a, a bloodstream infection study that was just reported in the New England just two weeks ago showing uh, uh, equipoise with uh, um, daptomycin for bacteremia. Um, I think we can move on from this. Just yeah. the, the combined nephrotoxicity is an important consideration with vancomycin and why many people use a, a lot of linazolid these days. Um, small colony variants are things that uh, we know are probably underreported um, in most studies and probably most clinical labs. Um, how often are um, your labs reporting small colony variants in your staph aureus, whether it's uh, MSSA or MRSA? Maybe rephrasing that question, yeah. will your lab report, yeah. will they report if they identify small colony variant staph aureus? Maybe just a show of hands. Yeah. I'm distracted by the different types of nodding. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that's obviously an important consideration as well, just given the challenges we have with uh, a small colony variance and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and preferred agents often being things like tetracyclines, doxycyclines, minocyclines. All right. All right. So um, for, like I said, like we said, the, these other cases are really much shorter and just kind of raise a few issues. So this is case four, an Acromobacter um, species chronic infection. So a 34-year-old female with moderate CF lung disease with a chronic Acromobacter is admitted with a 15% um, absolute decline in lung function. So her baseline is uh, FEV1 is 60%. So. First, the first one of the first points is um, what types of Acromobacter species actually cause infections. I think that it's important to point out that there are at least 18 and probably other species of Acromobacter um, that can be identified with, but they can't be identified with routine laboratory methods. So one of the issues that is in, in the past, labs used to routine, routinely identify everything as Acromobacter xylazoxidans, and that's not the case. So you either need uh, multi. Uh, 
a multi locus sequence typing or potentially a specialized research based like Maldi Toff database or some other mechanisms to actually identify them to the species level. Whether or not that's relevant is another question because you know it's a chromobacter. Um, there is some association with um, some uh, mechanism of, of aminoglycoside resistance. So, for instance, there's an efflux pump that's identified routinely in some of the species but not the others. Um, if your lab actually is doing susceptibility testing, you would probably see a pattern that suggests that. And that's something that they're probably set up to do as opposed to the advanced uh, uh, speciation that might be necessary. Because routine sequencing that a lot of labs will do actually is not going to be sufficient for identifying to the species level. Um, so what are some of the challenges that are associated with a chromobacter species infections? One, there have been reports that there's potentially epidemic strains. And so one example is in Belgium, there were 31 patients that where they identified two clusters of related strains. And so this is maybe not a challenge necessarily for your patient, but is a challenge for you to think about if you're seeing a lot of acromobacter infections showing up that you had not previously been seeing. But then the second question is actually related to lung function. And so um, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> Ron, you yes. Is there any uh, particular uh, Okay, so then the question for the for those of you who may not have heard is are there any particular laboratory clues or other information that you can use to distinguish whether or not a chromobacter is actually the cause of symptoms in your patient who may very well be infected with other organisms or not? And I would say no. You have to kind of use the whole clinical picture to try and determine whether or not there's another cause. And so I think you're going to um, find yourself in the situation where if you think there's another likely cause and you think that treating the acromobacter is going to be um, challenging for one reason or another, then maybe you treat the other cause first. And then if you're still not seeing a response to therapy in that patient, then maybe you step back and ask whether or not you need to treat the acromobacter. And I think often you see, and I mean, particularly in the adults cohorts that you see co-infection quite frequently with pseudomonas as well. So um, so I think it is hard to parse out. And, and certainly the our sickest patients are those that are most likely to uh, acquire these types of infections and generally because they're exposed to other antimicrobials that are suppressing, you know, perhaps their pseudomonas with their aminoglycoside and then a, and a chromobacter or a stenochromus mm -hmm. pops up. And trying to understand its impact is always a challenge. Because what can come up, you know, when they do telephone uh, treatment, for example, yeah yeah no no absolutely I, I mean and maybe just using an agent that covers both and then you're addressing if you, yeah if you have that option <laughs> So, like, and this comes back to the question of like how, and that was part of the reason for including a chromobacter, and then you'll potentially, if you make it to the next case as well, the question is, are you able to come up with a regimen that you think your patient will tolerate that yeah. doesn't involve five medications, yeah. hopefully, you know, that where you can have a limited number of medications that maybe would treat the kind of pathogens that you're most suspicious to be contributing to the patient's clinical picture. Yeah, if you can access one of the new beta-lactamase <laughs> Uh, agents or carbapenem ones, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so that raises the question again of like how strongly is a chromobacter actually associated with clinical symptoms <laughs> in um, cystic fibrosis and outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's largely based on retrospective cohort uh, studies. And so some have suggested um, deleterious outcomes with a chromobacter. This was one study that I was involved with and um, it used the Ontario cohort. And again, um, we found and we split up the patient cohort into people that had never had an infection, intermittent infection and chronic infection. Again, you could this is not validated for a chromobacter, but we used uh, pseudomonas definitions. Um, and although there were signals of increased uh, exacerbation rate um, with people with chronic in, a chromobacter infection, by the time we actually adjusted for the typical clinical confounders, it wasn't different. And they also experience a similar rate of FEV1 decline. So. Um, again, we're sort of left with we're not sure if it's a marker, and again, we tend to see it in people with exceptions in later disease, right, those with pseudomonas infection frequently, and so is it just a signal that they already have more severe disease and you're acquiring more pathogens? And it can be very hard to sort that out. Yeah. Um, so. 
Um, this raises the question of what antibiotics you might potentially use for treatment in a patient who has an acromobacter infection if you think that the acromobacter is actually contributing to their symptoms. And this just harkens back to some of the discussion that we had up front about the pseudomonas, is that there's different molecular me mechanisms that may be conferring resistance in acromobacter species. A lot of them will express um, multidrug efflux pumps, which is in part why they're actually um, intrinsically resistant to a lot of aminoglycoside um, antibiotics. And in addition, they express beta-lactamases, um, usually some that are a little bit more narrow spectrum, potentially, um, so that there's, uh, but then they can also acquire kind of more, even broader spectrum beta-lactamase um, enzymes from other organisms. And so, again, this is one of the settings where I think if you think the acromobacter is contributing and you're not seeing a response to therapy, either getting molecular testing for me mechanisms of resistance or switching to an empiric antibiotic that you think is going to be entirely out of um, not susceptible to these mechanisms of resistance may be useful. Um, and, and there have been limited um, reports of susceptibility patterns for some of the newer agents, but what I would um, point out is that the numbers in general are very small. So for instance, here we're looking at mirapenem or mirapenem um, barbabactam, uh, Ceftazidine and ceftazidine and avibactam, but the range of the range of MICs that you're seeing are still quite broad, and I think that that's probably in part due to the fact that some of these acromobacter have actually acquired um, these beta lactamases that um, maybe where these uh, beta lactamase inhibitors are not going to be as effective, and um, and it's hard to predict that just knowing only the species. And this is another instance where phage therapy might be an option for your patient, which we again had already discussed. Um, in case one. And the last case is very brief here, which is just, <laughs> um, you have a new culture that's positive for stenotrophomonas in a 22-year-old um, female with a history of advanced CF lung disease, whose um, FEV1 is normally 38% predicted. Um, she has a chronic pseudomonas aeruginosa infection that she's alternating um, between inhaled tobramycin and estreonam. And um, she has a new expectorated sputum culture that's growing stenotrophomonas mal maltophilia, but is currently asymptomatic. Um, so again, we kind of find ourselves in the same situation that we do with a chromobacter in that um, stenotrophomonas has been reported in populations of CF patients basically um, quite broadly around the world, although rates may vary a bit, it generally is in the 5 to 15 percent range. Um, and that there are studies that suggest that it's associated with lung function decline, but when a lot of those studies try to adjust for confounders, it's not totally clear that the, that they're, that the association is as strong as maybe we think it would be. But the reason we've included it here is because, in part, it's intrinsically multidrug resistant, and a lot of the antibiotics that you might use for the other pathogens that you're treating in this patient may not actually be effective. So since we discussed eradication earlier, does anybody actually have any, has anybody actually tried to attempt eradication for stenotrophomonas if they're asymptomatic? Probably I have. I have not. <laughs> so we, we, we've done it not terribly uncommonly, mm -hmm. um, and generally it works, but when we've actually looked retrospectively, um, I don't think it actually does um, because it goes away <laughs> on its own so often. Um, and invariably, it's a different strain type. We've had some patients that we, we've done typing on, and in the course of five years, they've had nine different strain types of Centromotus multifilia that are entirely unrelated. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, this is a, this again is a challenging situation because you have people with advanced lung disease, right? So you're, if you're at 30%, uh, and I'm talking pre ETI especially, and uh, you have really no room to move, right? And so it's that discussion of, hey, there's not really great evidence, but it's a new bug, and they and they often are scared. They're like, oh my god, mm -hmm. I was just growing pseudomonas, I was used to that, and now I have this new thing that I need to deal with. So then you have this discussion where you're like, well, I'm not sure if this is going to work or help, but we don't have room to be wrong because if you suddenly get sick with this and you lose 10 percent, that's mm -hmm. a third of your lung function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so now the same patient comes back three months later, um, has having some increased cough and sputum production, and the FEV1 is down. There's no new pathogens. They still have the pseudomonas and stenotrophomonas at this point. And so if you're designing a regimen, given that you don't have a lot of margin for error here, probably you're going to try and include the stenotrophomonas in your treatment regimen. And so um, what agents do you routinely think about starting? Um, I think about Septra. Yeah. 
So trimethoprim sulfamethox is always probably our first line. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, there's also potentially susceptibility to um, tetracyclines, sometimes levofloxacin, yeah. and rarely um, ceftazidine, but that's not very, that's much less common. Um, and so, as we said, we probably would include it in this instance, given that the patient doesn't have a lot of reserve. Um, so that's the end of kind of the prepared cases that we had for discussion, knowing that there's a couple minutes left in our session, are there other things that um, people either wanted to share or questions that they wanted to ask that we're happy to chime in on? Yep. I would, if you might comment just on the on eradication, given that after being with a few of these slides, how uh, purple theory is patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that was our, our sixth case. We decided to remove it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, it's, I think it's a really important question. Um, one of the important things is the limitations of our own clinical laboratories in telling us what Burkholderia cepatia complex we're actually dealing with. Um, when I'm talking to trainees, I always say Burkholderia cepatia complex like Honda. There's, you know, some civics out there, but there's also some NSXs. There's a wide variety in terms of what they can potentially do. Um, fortunately, if you have a large enough lab, um, MALDI does actually reasonably well di discriminate between um, the, the different members of the cepatia complex, and there's certainly some that we're going to panic a lot more about. Um, we still routinely will eradicate um, many of what we see. Um, whether it makes a difference or not, I cannot say. Um, we just eradicate harder if we're dealing with the senosepatia, which we've had, I don't know, three or four in the last five years that we've seen. Uh, but fortunately, none that were related to, to ones that we had actually had ongoing. Um, one of the most important things when you're dealing with cepatia is to recognize we have experts amongst our community and reach out to them for support. And Dr. Lapuma is <laughs> trying to, to duck from my site here, but uh, um, so there's lots of resources out there. Certainly, there's lots of uh, treatment protocols that have been published um, and some that report good success using things like high-dose tobramycin and amylaride, um, and some that throw in combinations of high dose uh, orally bioavailable agents. And then again, with the senosepatias and the gladioli eyes, um, you see people push a little harder um, with long courses of parenteral therapies. And I think encouragingly, at least in Canada, the epidemiology has shifted to more multivorans. And mm -hmm. um, so we did do a study using the same Toronto database and it looked like multivorans, people with multivorans infection didn't necessarily do any worse than um, other groups. So. Yeah. So it's so it really I think comes it is probably important to figure out what species. What is the idea about the having chronic colonization with um, yeah. you, you, you may get a different uh, yeah. um, opinion between adults and, and, and pediatrician <laughs> physicians, I, would, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, uh, so the question was, in the setting of highly effective modulators, is there a role for um, trying to eradicate MSSA. Um, MSSA in particular? And I would say that is not an approach that our center has taken. I think that um, a lot of times the perspective is that something is going to kind of fill that niche. If the patient's actually um, doing well from a lung health perspective and they're tolerating their um, ETI, um, I don't know that there's actually much utility in doing that. Um, and uh, and also, I, as an ID doc, I, sometimes, I often will think that if there's going to be a staff that's kind of decided to establish it's the itself. friendlier one. Yes, it's the friendlier one. And so do I really want to clear that niche out yeah. and then have them... Have steno. Yeah. <laughs> or potentially MRSA or something. Yeah. And so... Yeah. Um, because admittedly, it's um, it does happen occasionally, but it's not that common that um, at least in our pediatric patients that we see patients who are co-infected with MSSA and MRSA, they generally tend to have one or the other. So if they're going to have one and they're doing well, I would prefer that it's MSSA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the yeah. expression "nature abhors a vacuum" I think is very apt yeah. here. <laughs> um, and, and the other important thing is. The, the natural history of chronic MSSA infection is very different than Pseudomonas. If you follow patients mm -hmm. longitudinally for years and years, there's actually strain turnover that happens. It's not necessarily the same strain for 25 years that we see with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So 
understanding that natural history is, is, is a, a gap I think we really have still. Yeah. And I and think if people are well, it's, I think it's reasonable to monitor and because I do think we need to re-understand or relearn how people do mm -hmm. and how people tolerate having chronic colonization or infection, whatever term you want to use for the, for the bug in the modulator era. And I, I would say that that context has also changed the way I have discussions with my patients about mycobacteria. <clears throat> yeah. um, because when they are, um, when it's less clear whether or not they have any real symptoms or not, and they're very vague, if their lung function is stable and they're tolerating their ETI and stuff, I'm like, well, you know, I, this is, it's something that really needs to be a discussion. And I yeah. can't give you a strong recommendation in this setting because I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I would say, so what the context I found myself in is the other setting more often where patients have um, not been able to eradicate their abscesses. They've been on long-term chronic therapy that seems that was really required to suppress their symptoms for a long time because if we tried taking them off, they did worse. And then they started ETI and they've stabilized. They're not ending up in the hospital as much. And in those settings, I sometimes have said, you know, you're getting tired of taking these antibiotics. It's not clear they're offering you any benefit anymore. Maybe we should stop and see how you do because we're not eradicating this, which was the goal of trying to do this prolonged course of therapy to begin with. So I, I would say it's colored those discussions more often. Um, in our center, since patients have started ETI, um, I have not been asked by my colleagues to see as many patients with new abscessus infections. We don't have a high enough number to say whether or not that's a trend that's going to hold true or not, but I thankfully have not found myself having those discussions quite as much. Yeah, we just, I just started somebody on MAC therapy, but again, you know, I think um, there's the ideal solutions to things, but pragmatically it really still comes down to like, are they doing worse? And then... If before you throw all things, including the kitchen sink at someone, you know, they need to be willing to do it. And if you try to convince someone that has zero symptoms, they're not going to take it anyways. So um, I think if they have symptoms and they have disease, then it'll warrant treatment. Yeah, around, and I think one of the things that probably that um, has been discussed at least peripherally around some of the other sessions is like in the setting of MAC, like, you often are using a rifamycin. Yeah. And so then you're balancing, well, do we use the therapies that we historically used all the time or do we have to come up with an alternative therapy because we think that your highly effective modulators are probably just as important as I, at treating this infection. And so it's really changed the color and type of discussions that I think we're having with our patients. And we are now in an area in an era when we just don't have as much kind of data to help guide those discussions. And hopefully we'll get that data, but we're not there yet. But as infectious disease doctors, since half of what we do is based on expert opinion, we're comfortable in this space. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>